if you miss the fact that it's Valentine's Day, either you don't care uh, or you're in trouble or you don't care that you're in trouble, which means you probably are in more trouble than you realize. Or maybe you just uh, don't have uh, what you feel is a Valentine-worthy relationship, in which case you may need some cheering up. So I thought perhaps that these uh, words of advice and wisdom from kids on the subject of love might uh, cheer you up and maybe inspire you tonight. When asked what the proper age to get married is, uh, Tommy, age five, I didn't really necessarily answer the question, but he says, once I'm done with kindergarten, I'm going to find me a wife. Well, what do people do on the first date? Michael, age nine, says, on the first date, they just tell each other lies, and that usually gets them interested enough to go for a second date. <laughs> when is it okay to kiss somebody? Well, Jeannie, age 10, says, it's never okay to kiss a boy. They always slobber all over you. That's why I stopped doing it. <laughs> age 10, all right. Is it better to be single or married? Well, according to Lynette, age 9, it's better for girls to be single, but not for boys, because boys need somebody to clean up after them. <laughs> He's le learning early. How does it happen that two particularly people fall in love? And, and Jan, age nine, says, well, no one is quite sure why it happens, but I heard it has something to do with how you smell. That's why perfume and deodorant are so popular. Well, what is love like? Well, according to Roger, age nine, it's like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. <laughs> Get out while you can, huh? Ways to make somebody fall in love with you. Well, Alonzo, age nine, says, well, don't do things like have smelly green sneakers. You might get attention, but attention ain't the same as love. Truer words never spoken. All right. Bart, age nine, says, one way is to take the girl out to eat. Make sure it's something she likes. French fries usually works for me. A lot of experience here. How does a person learn how to kiss? Well, Douglas, age seven, says, you learn it right on the spot when that gushy feeling gets the best of you. And then uh, Rand, age nine, had his mind on some kissing, too. He said, how can, a marriage, uh, how can a married couple keep their love going? And he said, be a good kisser. It might make your wife forget that you never take out the trash. I'll have to see if that one, that one works. I don't think that'll work for me, but... Anyway, uh, maybe you learned something there. Hopefully, we've all learned something since uh, we were that age. So let me ask you, uh, what are the most uh, important and vital uh, components of a great relationship? You can name two or three traits that are indispensable for a relationship like a marriage or maybe a close friendship, not only to survive, but to thrive. Uh, what would those traits be? And don't, don't overthink it here. Communication. Communication. What are we celebrating today? Love. What else do people need between themselves? I gave my wife some. Respect. Trust. Right there, probably two of the most, I don't know if you'd agree with me, perhaps the two most important aspects of any relationship would be love and trust. Without love, what relationship do you have? And without trust, how is it going to last? And that's not only true of a human relationship. That's also true of our relationship uh, with God. And we're going to look at that tonight. Uh, two components that are directly related to that love and that trust are at the core of what we're going to consider tonight in Romans chapter 9. And one of those traits has to do with God's initiative toward us, and the other has to do with how we respond toward him. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And then down in verse number 10 of that passage, it says, uh, This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So love comes from God. Even the love we have uh, for him or the love we have for anybody else is only possible because God first loved us. And what does he ask from us in return? Uh, even more than us reciprocating that love, from the very first time uh, we come to him to receive uh, forgiveness and eternal life, what is it that we need in order to receive that? Talked about it this morning. 
talks about faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, we were saved by grace. Now that's related to love. The word uh, charis, charismatic, people who focus on the gifts, but also the root of that is charity. It deals with love. So we're saved by God's grace. That's his part through faith. And that's our part. So I mentioned we're going to focus on a couple traits directly related to love and trust. More specifically, I want us to consider mercy and faith. God's mercy, that's his initiative toward us. And our faith, that's our response toward him. Now, because of God's love, he showed us mercy and offered forgiveness in new life. And if we trust in God's mercy, we're going to respond with faith and receive that life. Apart from God's mercy, there's no hope. And apart from faith, the Bible says in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 6, he said it this morning, it is impossible to please God. So both mercy on God's part and faith on ours. Now, God's mercy and our faith are pretty straightforward concepts, and that's a good thing because tonight's chapter, uh, Romans 9, is one of those chapters that the practical things can get really lost in a lot of the theology. And so rather than pulling out an isolated passage or a particular verse that quite honestly might make for a, a more dynamic message, we're going to walk through this verse by verse, and I think that's going to help us understand it a little bit better. And then at the end, we're going to pull it together, pull out a, a, a few of the main points and some very practical principles we're going to apply. So let's dig in. Romans chapter 9. If you're not there, get there. Get on your Bibles. Get on your device because I want you to keep your nose in that as we look through it. That's going to keep you in it with me. Now, it's hard to follow what happened this morning. I'll be honest with you. Believe it or not, I was actually a candidate and invited to come and pastor a predominantly black church. And um, so I do have some of that in me. I don't think most of you have ever heard that because it's been hard for me. I've been doing more preach or teaching than preaching in recent years, and it's hard for me to get out of that mode. But I can cut loose, so maybe one of these days. But not tonight. We're going to do a little teaching tonight, so a little more straightforward. And so I want you to stick with me. In Romans chapter 9 uh, now, uh, to give this message a title tonight, I've called it Don't Resist, because you're going to see by the end that that's one of the main points that I want to bring out uh, of all this before we're done. So right here, let's start in uh, Romans 9, beginning in verse 1, and Paul's talking, and I say, speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race. Now, we're going to come back to this at the end because there's something to learn from Paul's attitude uh, toward people who are spiritually lost. And, of course, he's speaking in verse number 4, the people of Israel. For theirs is the adoption to sonship, theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. Amen. Now, Paul is understandably distraught by the irony of how God's chosen people, the ones through whom he revealed his plan of salvation to the world, how they of all people missed the whole point of the law and the prophecies and the sacrifices and everything that pointed to Christ, who they failed to recognize as the Messiah, the promised Savior, because they were looking for an earthly kingdom rather than a spiritual one. A pick up in verse number six, it says, it is not as though God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. Now he's making a point that it's not a physical issue, uh, a relationship, but it's a spiritual one. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now, Abraham had other, had other children besides Isaac. But Isaac was the one of promise. He was the one who God came to him when Abraham was about 100 years old and Sarah was well beyond the years of childbearing and promised that that son would come. So we're talking about promise here. In other words, it's not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Now, remember what it was about Abraham that pleased God? In Romans chapter 4, it goes more in depth than this and really calls Abraham our spiritual father of, of faith. Yeah. So those descendants of Abraham that it's talking about are not just his physical descendants, but those who follow his example of having faith in God's promise. Uh, verse 9, for this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Now, it's simply laying out how God's plan of salvation is going to be revealed for, through a particular family line or descendants. But again, it's based on God's promise. 
It doesn't have a ton to do with the, the physical descendants. God made a sovereign choice. Not only that, but Rebekah's children, these are Abe's grandsons, were conceived at the same time by his father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, talking about Jacob and Esau, uh, or before they had done anything good or bad. Now Paul is pointing out that whatever God was doing here through his physical descendancy uh, was not based on human efforts or accomplishment or worthiness. Again, it had to do with God's promise. In fact, verse number 11 says, in order that God's purpose in election might stand. We're going to talk about that, that election for just a second. Not by works, but by him who calls. For she was told the older will serve the younger. That was backwards from the way it usually was because God's ways are a lot different than ours. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, uh, that sounds pretty harsh, uh, but essentially means I, I chose Jacob and I rejected Esau, or I didn't choose Esau. It doesn't mean that Jacob or his descendants, uh, Jacob was the one God renamed Israel. It doesn't mean that they had exclusive access to God's favor. Well, uh, Esau's descendants were just uh, destined for doom. Uh, God was just saying, here's who I'm choosing to use to fulfill my plan. He was going to do it one way or, the no one way or another. And he was simply choosing a family line, what you do. And there were reasons he chose Jacob. Uh, Jacob's faith, he was the one, a man he alluded to this morning, who wrestled with God, said, I'm not going to give up. And, and God laid hold of that faith. And he said, this is the family line I'm going to choose. But it didn't have anything to do with uh, him being more deserving or them being better or getting all God's blessing and tough luck to everyone else. Because in uh, chapters 9 through 11 of Romans, it talks quite a bit about the fact that the majority of Jacob's descendants actually failed to carry out out their God-given purpose, and eventually uh, they were rejected by God. Well, on the other hand, a lot of those who weren't originally chosen at first, the Gentiles, those who were not Israelite or Jewish, uh, they actually got in on the action uh, because they put their faith in Christ, and it says because of that, they became descendants of Abraham, and in fact, verse 25 and 26 calls them sons of the living God. The bottom line is that God made a sovereign choice that he was going to use this family line. It wasn't about who was going to be saved or condemned or who was going to get in on God's plan and who wasn't, but he simply was saying, this is who I'm going to use to fulfill a specific purpose. Now, uh, along those lines, uh, I want to address two kind of sticky theological issues just real briefly, and that is election and predestination. Election is mentioned in verse 11 here, and predestination is kind of implied. It comes up later in chapter 11 in, in a lot more depth, and, and then you see it in Colossians and Ephesians and I believe in Thessalonians and a few other places uh, in the Bible. And I want to just uh, dispel maybe a few discrepancies about uh, these things. But when the Bible talks about being elected or predestined, it doesn't mean that God is determining ahead of time who's going to be saved and who won't. If that was how it worked, then Jesus' great commission would lack almost any sense of urgency because God's going to get it done one way or the other, and if we get to it. And even Paul's kind of lament at the beginning of this chapter about uh, his own people who, who uh, you know, hadn't got with it and hadn't received Christ, that would really be a moot point if somehow uh, that was God's doing. So we see from Genesis chapter 2 onward, it is pretty clear that God gives us a choice in how we respond uh, to him. Now, God does have a plan. You could say a destiny uh, for each of us that he wants us to accomplish, uh, but we have a choice of how we're going to align ourselves with that plan. Now, the thing that has been determined, and maybe you could say predestined, is that there's a definite destination for both the saved and the unsaved, for those who entrust themselves to God and those who don't. God doesn't just pick who's going to go where. He knows, but God doesn't always determine those things that he knows are going to happen. The thing that is uh, set apart ahead of time is that there is a final destination for those who put their faith in him. They're going to spend eternal life with him, and those who don't are going to be separated from him uh, forever. But people can choose which of those they're going to do, but those are the destinations that are set. Now, kind of to illustrate this, uh, it's kind of like the world is a sinking ship. Kind of like the Titanic. It's, it's uh, broken. It's beyond repair. Uh, it's destined for destruction. It's going down. And most people are on, on, going to choose to stay on that ship. That's the sad reality. But God has provided uh, a lifeboat. He has provided a, a rescue ship. The Bible even refers to it as an ark of safety. And uh, when it talks about the elect, Jesus is the captain. That's why he established a church, and Jesus is the captain of that ship. 
And for those who trust God and they board that ship, they become God's elect. That ship is for God's elect, but people choose whether they're going to board that ship. And uh, they're elect because of the relationship with the captain and the place that they've chosen to be on his ship. So election is about the state of our relationship with God, and we choose how to respond to that. Now, predestination is about where the ship is headed. Uh, it's the ultimate destination that God has determined for those who uh, get on and stay on his ship. And for those, uh, they're going to find eternal life with God. Jesus invites everyone to get aboard the ship but most are not going to choose that. And for those who don't, those who by virtue of their own choice decide to stay on the sinking ship, they are destined for destruction because of their own choice. But it's their decision. Their decision determines their destination. And that's an issue of faith, not fate. So while this passage kind of highlights a lot about God's sovereignty and the ability to do as he pleases, it really indicates that a lot of people who experienced God's blessing and his mercy, ultimately refused to trust him. And that's what was going on with most of Israel. And honestly, they were without excuse because of all the, the grace and mercy that God does extend to us in his blessings and the opportunity he gives us for far more than we uh, deserve. And that's what it talks about in verse number, uh, verse number 14 when it says, what should we say then? Is God unjust? Not at all, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy uh, on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I want to back up for just a second and divine a couple things there. Uh, mercy and grace are two kind of closely related concepts, and you may have heard uh, mercy or grace is defined as unmerited favor. It's getting something we don't deserve. So that's grace. Grace is getting something that we don't deserve. And that could be a forgiveness, eternal life. We have grace because we don't deserve those things. Mercy, on the other hand, is not getting things that we do deserve. Punishment, separation from God. And when God spares us uh, from those things, my thing just took a weird turn here. When God spares us from those things and he gives us the opportunity for eternal life, uh, then... Uh, hold on just a second here. Lost my train of thought. This thing flipped around. If you don't touch it right, it does weird things. And it, sometimes it even disappears here. All right, let me pick up where I was at here. When God spares us from things like punishment and the separation from God uh, and gives us hope and life and purpose instead, then we're getting way beyond what we deserve. So that answers the question, uh, you know, is God unjust? No, he gives us way more than we deserve by the chance he gives us and by the mercy he extends. Now, because of God's mercy, he offers us eternal life. And that offer is open to anyone. And the way we receive that is by faith. So you see, God's mercy and our faith are the key components. And that's why those described in the first part of this chapter who were originally chosen, they ultimately missed out on God's call because they lacked faith. Well, on the other hand, many who were not originally chosen, including us, they got in on the action because, uh, and God always intended that, but they did because they made that choice and they put their faith in Christ. Not because of their works or because of their worthiness, not based on our merits, but based on God's mercy. And again, uh, it all comes down to how we respond is how we're used in God's plan. And that, uh, where it picked up in verse 17 about somebody who was used in God's plan in a way that sounds a little bit strange to us. So we're going to open in. Verse 17, it says, in Scripture, it says to Pharaoh, referring to the Egyptian ruler from the Old Testament book of Exodus, I raised you up for this very purpose, uh, again, alluding to God's sovereignty, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he has mercy and hardens who he wants to harden. Now again, uh, God extends mercy to everyone, but only those who trust him uh, reap the full benefits of that mercy. Well, on the other hand, those who resist him and reject him, uh, they become even more hard-hearted toward God. And that's what's going on in this passage because you recall when the Israelites were slaved in Egypt and God sent Moses to Pharaoh to tell him to let the people go and Pharaoh kept refusing. It says in that passage at some points that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart is attributed to God, that God hardened his heart. Other times it's attributed to Pharaoh, but a lot of people have problems with that because it's like, well, if God, uh, you know, hardened him and made him resist and then turns on and, pun and punishes him for it, that's not really fair. But keep in mind that Pharaoh was defiant from the very beginning. God was not forcing him to do anything. But when God confronts and continues to confront somebody who's hard-hearted toward him, what usually happens? 
They get even harder. They get even more resistant, which is what was happening with Pharaoh when he kept uh, holding out and refused to bend even though the plagues were getting worse and worse. So in a way, you could say that God's persistence resulted in greater resistance, but it was still uh, Pharaoh's choice. Now, even in this, we see a lot of times God using this principle of spiritual hardening as a, as a means of judging people. In essence, he's giving them what they want and letting them suffer the consequences for it. But even in that, we see God's mercy because uh, here's what's happening. The harder that something becomes and the more resistant to God, the harder it gets. All the while, something even stronger is pushing down on it. What's eventually gonna happen? It's gonna hit a breaking point. Something's gonna give. And seldom will a hard-hearted person ever turn to God, ever turn from their own way until they reach that breaking point where they see I've got nowhere to go but to God. My way isn't cutting it. And if at that point they will turn from their own way and they will surrender to God, then he pours the oil of his spirit onto that hard heart, begins to soften it and remold it according to his plan. So verse number 19, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Again, just him making the point of God's sovereignty in all this. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does the, uh, not the potter have the right to make of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common uses? Again, all this choosing a God is simply doing things for a special purpose. You walk into your garage and pick up a particular tool for a particular thing. God made us with certain skills and abilities, and he's simply choosing to use us for various purposes. So again, it's God's sovereign choice. And God has the power and authority to do whatever he wants. That's what it means to be sovereign. But that doesn't mean there's a lack of integrity on God's part because he's not subject to, to fallible human wisdom. He's subject to his own perfect understanding, which means he knows uh, what to do in what situation and when to extend mercy and when to exercise judgment. So verse number 22 says, What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction. God always precedes judgment with mercy. God always takes his patience way beyond where you and I ever would, even with ourselves sometime before that judgment ever comes. And when it says the objects of his wrath, that simply refers to those who are headed for destruction because of their own choices. And Paul says in Romans chapter 2, 5, but because of your own stubbornness and your own unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath. But the emphasis is still on God's mercy because anyone can go from being an object of wrath headed for destruction to an object of mercy headed for eternal life simply by turning from their own way and following Christ. Verse number 23, what if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy? All these things he's doing to reveal his plans to people whom he prepared in advance for his glory, even us who he has called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As it says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in every place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the children of the living God. So all this stuff about God choosing some and not others is simply a matter of who God used to reveal his plans to everyone. Because ultimately, all people have the opportunity for new life in Christ. And it's available to anyone through faith. Sadly, most people are still going to choose the, the wide road of the world that leads to destruction. Because they refuse to walk that narrow path that leads to eternal life with Christ. And that's all part of what it's talking about in these last few verses when it talks about the remnant. It says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. Again, relatively few people are going to deny themselves and follow Christ. For the Lord will carry out uh, his sentence on earth with speed and finality. And just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty has left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, he was working a plan through a particular family line so that he could have uh, descendants of faith, not of any physical realm. Otherwise, we'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, those places were destroyed because of their defiance of God. But God's mercy gives hope to anyone who puts their faith in him and receives grace rather than rejecting it. So he comes full circle in verse number 30 and comes back to the issue of Israel. He says, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained a righteousness that is by faith, 
But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as it were, by works. So how could people with all the history and the ancestry and the prophecy and the promises, how could they miss it? And in God's law that basically pointed the way, it says that law is a schoolmaster to point us the way to Christ. How could they miss it? Well, a bunch of outsiders, including us, reap the benefits of God's mercy. Well, it's because that it was never about human inheritance or understanding or effort or anything on our part. It's always been about God's mercy and having the faith to accept Jesus as the only way. And that's the problem they had in this passage. They missed it because they could not accept the fact that Jesus was the only way. So verse number 32 says, They stumbled over the stumbling stone. That is, it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him, again, the issue of faith, will never be put to shame. That stone that people stumble over to this day is Jesus. When he gets in the way of their selfishness and their faulty intellect and their futile plans and they can't surrender or acknowledge Christ, uh, it's going to trip them up. And that's what happened with the people at the beginning of this passage, that, that they knew God's way and yet they still tried to do it their way. Well, many who weren't originally chosen by God heard the message and responded in faith and they found new life in Christ. Again, it all comes down to how a person responds to Christ, whether it's with doubt and defiance or in faith and obedience. But the only appropriate response to God's mercy is always faith. Ephesians chapter two, for by grace are you saved through faith. And not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so no one can boast. But I love verse 10 here because it just, we, we kind of skip verse 10, but it just talked about none of this is by works. No, you don't do anything by works. You don't come to God by works. And yet right after that, it says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us. So that's part of what he's destined for us to do is those good works. So even though works don't save us, there's still a big part of our relationship with God. So it's not a matter of us being saved by works, but we are saved for good works. Faith comes first, and if the faith is, faith is real, the works are gonna follow. So even though works don't save us, God has a lot for us to do. So the big takeaway from this entire chapter, and actually one of the main points of God's entire word, is simply this. It's all about God's mercy, not about our merits. Never been about our ability to meet God's standard or fulfill his purpose by our own initiative or efforts. It's about God extending mercy to the undeserving and because God extends mercy to all of us, we all have the opportunity by faith to get on board God's rescue ship with Jesus as the captain destined for eternal life with him. And remember, God is the one who initiates all of this. Okay? Even his spirit is the one who draws us to him and he inspires the faith. But it's still up to us because our decision determines our direction and our destination. And only as we entrust ourselves to Christ and follow his path are we going to fulfill his purpose for our lives. So here's the primary points of all that. First of all, God's part. God's sovereignty. He, uh, he chooses people. He chooses uh, groups. He chooses nations. He chooses churches to use in some way, not because of their words and worthiness, not to determine who's going to be saved or unsaved or blessed or not blessed. He simply chooses them to reveal specific purposes and plans. And God's sovereignty was evident in how he worked and chose Israel as a means of revealing that plan of salvation. The second thing of God is God's mercy, as we talked about over and over. He extends mercy to all of us so we can receive that forgiveness and fulfill that purpose that he's destined for us. And God's mercy is evident in how he extends salvation to the Gentiles or all people who accept his message and his mercy by putting their faith in him. So that's God's part, sovereignty and mercy. Our part, again, is faith. It still comes down to our response to God. Will we receive or will we resist God's mercy? And resistance is going to result in a hardened heart. But if we receive it and accept it and put our faith in him, it's going to allow us to fulfill that purpose. And that leads to the works because the works are part of it. That's where they come in. Faith uh, really equals trust and obedience. It's active. It's active. 
And we aren't saved by faith. Uh, 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 works don't result in salvation, but true salvation results in good works. And good works honor God. Now, one of the primary ways that we honor God and fulfill his purpose is by reaching out to those who don't know Christ. And, and, and that's why I want to close by revisiting Paul's words at the beginning of this chapter. Because his obvious uh, and very intense sorrow over his own people's failure to acknowledge Christ uh, really is an example of the kind of compassion we need for people who don't know him. He was so grieved that it said he would have given up his own place in God's plan if only his fellow Hebrews would have accepted Christ. And although we couldn't do anything about it, uh, that passion is an example to us of the kind of heart we need for people who are lost. You know, it's really easy to take for granted uh, our salvation and, and uh, just to say others have made their choice and that's that. But Jesus gives us the responsibility and the privilege to reach out to those who don't know him to bring his message and his love to them. And the Holy Spirit equips and enables us to do that. I remember when I was uh, in college at North Central and I was looking out my dorm window one night across the street and I saw a man sleeping on a park bench. And I just said to myself, why am I here and why is, why is he there? And it was real easy to kind of write it off and so I made my choices, he's made his and that's the result of it. But as I thought about it, and I thought, you know what, uh, if I were him, if I had his mind and, and, and his body and, and his family and the sum of all his experiences, then quite honestly, that would likely be me out there. And at that point, it suddenly realized, maybe this just is all predetermined. But then I sensed God saying to me, the reason that you're here is because I've chosen you and given you the privilege to bring my message to him and others like him. And if he responds to that in faith, he can in turn spread the message to others. And that's faith in action. So I want to look at three action steps that uh, we can take from all this. If you didn't hear anything else of all that, just kind of going into depth, this is what I want you to get. These three things are what I want us to take with us. The first one is simply this. We put on at home over and over, is the only adequate response to God's mercy is our faith. And both of those things are initiated by God Okay, he draws us and he inspires the faith, but it's still our decision and our choice. And that brings me to the second part here. And if this is the only thing you get from this, I want you to get it. And I want you to get it in you good. And that is when God calls, do not resist. When God calls, don't resist or reject that call, but respond in faith with trust and obedience. Because if we resist, it's going to harden us. It's going to harden us to his voice and to his presence in the future. And we're going to miss what he has for us. But if we respond in faith, it will free you to fulfill God's plan for your life. And that principle of resisting God's mercy and not resisting God's mercy applies not only at the initial time when we receive his forgiveness and new life, but it continues to pervade every aspect of our relationship with God. Because if he's calling you to do something or not do something, if he's asking you to give or to give up or to give in, if he's asking you to make a choice or take a chance or to make a change, if he's asking you to trust him when you don't have any clue where you're going, if he's asking you to reach out and, and extend compassion or mercy or do something practical for someone, whatever it is that he's asking you, don't resist. Don't harden yourself. Don't become desensitized to God's voice. Don't risk missing out on his perfect plan for your life, whether it's the plan for this moment, the plan for that day, or the plan for your life in general. Respond to him with faith and trust him to give you the ability to fulfill whatever he's calling you to do. And do it without delay, because delayed obedience is disobedience. And the third thing is what we just finished talking about. One of the primary responses to God's mercy, and perhaps the greatest indication of whether we're really obeying, is to follow his great commission to take his message to the spiritually lost people around us. Paul would have given anything to see his own people have the plan that God intended for them. Do we have that same passion for others. God isn't asking us to make them change. He's not asking us like Paul would have been willing to to give up our place in him. But he is saying, I want you to respond to my mercy by extending that same grace and compassion to people who need to know him. So this is how we're going to pray tonight. I just want to bring it down to two practical prayer points. And we're not going to necessarily have to spend a long time because this is one of those messages where it's just you just do it. You go out and do. And I'm not saying tonight just whatever God may speak to you tonight, but 
From now on, when God says something to you, don't miss out. That's what all throughout the word, people missed out because they resisted. They failed to obey, sometimes with immediacy. That's what happened with Israel here. They resisted. And God moved on from things because God's plans are going to be fulfilled. We decide how we're going to respond to those and align with those purposes. So from now on, whenever you hear God calling you to do anything, don't resist, but respond. But tonight, I want to just to spend a couple moments in prayer and to ask yourself, what is God asking me to do right now? What does he, what does he want you to, to do or not do, to give or to change or to pursue? Whatever it is, don't resist that, but respond in faith. Some of you already know. Some of you have maybe been wrestling with things already. Some of you, he may have told you something about somebody at work or something to do with your own vocation or maybe whatever step to take. Some of you, he may speak something specific to you tonight, but whatever that is, trust his plan and obey his rule. Regardless of what you see, you may not see how it's gonna be done, but respond to that and rely on him for the guidance and strength to step out. And the second thing is this, just take some time to pray for those in your circle of influence and maybe more so for ourselves that say, God, use me to reach out to the people around me at my work, maybe in my neighborhood, maybe even people in my own family. Just trust God to use you to reach and provide the opportunities to connect, to build relationships, to give you the right words at the right time. And a lot of times it's not words, it's just how we act toward them. And those are the two things that before we close tonight, I just want you to stand with me. And I'll say this because I don't want to miss any opportunity for those of you who God is calling maybe at the first time to yourself that you would respond to that. And if you're here tonight and that's the call he's making to you, he's calling you to receive his forgiveness and new life and entrust your life to him. And, and that's it. Don't resist that because you don't bring yourself to him. He draws you there. Don't miss that opportunity. And I'm not even going to walk you through it tonight. If that's you and you're simply willing to acknowledge I've gone my own way and sinned against God, but I believe Jesus is God's son who died in my place and rose again with the power and authority to give me new life. And if you'll confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He'll give you a fresh start and he'll start using you for whatever plans he intends you. And if that's you tonight, you just need to spend a few moments between you and God confessing that and getting that relationship right. And for all the rest of us, I, wanna, I want us just to focus on those two things for just a bit before we close. Ask God, God, what are you telling me to do? What have you been telling me? What are you asking of me? Uh, I've maybe been kind of resistant, kind of put, don't resist any longer. Please do not resist God. I don't know if many of you would have dug that out out of all the theology in that chapter, but that's really what it comes down to. Follow, respond to God's mercy with faith, and you're going to be all right. He's going to fulfill the plans that he has for your life. But it takes a step of faith. And usually that's kind of blind. Man, he said something today. I've never quite heard it this way. He said the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. That's the time when you don't need to have any faith if it's already is certain there. We need to have faith and trust because you're not always going to see what he's calling you. He wants you to, to just say, I'm willing at first. Don't resist. But when he tells you to step out, you step out. You know, the people who come up here, we hear testimonies, videos, whatever, and you hear great testimonies of God. Usually it's somebody who took a pretty bold step. Something busted loose at school or work or they let something lord or a miracle happen. Usually there was some step in there where they didn't have any clue what was going to happen beyond that. Don't resist God. Step out. Respond to his mercy and faith. And ask God to use you to reach those around you. We're going to be giving you some tools and strategy in the days ahead. We're going to see how simple that can really be. But just begin to prepare your heart now at building some relationship and asking God to use you. Would you just spend a few moments, find a place at this altar or where you're at tonight, and just spend time asking God to deal with those two things in your life when you feel it's time to go. Go in his grace and whatever he's telling you to do without hesitation, find a way to put that into action right away. And God will use you for the purpose that he's destined you for.